Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Social Flight Live. I'm Jeff Simon. We have such a fantastic show for you this evening. Rod Machado, America's flight instructor and aviation humorist, is here. I consider him a good friend and someone that I just have, I, I could talk for hours and, and just never get to the bottom of his knowledge. It is just so wonderful, and I cannot wait to share that with you this evening. Now, before we get started, just a few things. We are well into the first Fly to Win Challenge of 2024. We're giving away a Lightspeed Delta Zulu headset on February 1st. All you need to do is get the Social Flight mobile app for Apple or Android devices completely free. Just check in at your home airport and you are entered into win. If you check in at more airports and use it as you fly to get points and kind of play the game that's built into Social Flight, well then you can get extra entries if you're on our leaderboard. So lots and lots that you can do and we just keep giving things away here. We are here to support you and general aviation. In addition to that, uh, Social Flight right now, our FAA learning system is getting more and more courses as we enter 2024. And that matters for people that are looking for wings credits as well as mechanics looking for their uh, AMT awards program credits. And if you happen to be an AMP mechanic with an in, uh, inspection authorization, an IA, well, then you need eight hours of education per year if you want to use that to requalify for your IA. And uh, we give you all of that completely for free here on Social Flight. Again, just go to socialflight.com, look for the FAA credit section if you want to use our WINGS program, AMT program, uh, or IA renewals. And uh, again, we're getting more and more programs all the time, including uh, Brian Schiff's uh, Four Flight Workshops are on there. Just fantastic, fantastic content. So uh, be sure to check all of that out. Tonight's broadcast is brought to us by Tempest Aero and their fantastic oil filters, spark plugs, air filters, fuel pumps, and so much more. Tempest Aero has been a strong supporter of social flight for so many years, making all of this possible for everyone. And I have to say, as a mechanic and an IA myself, uh, I very sincerely only use their products when there is any choice whatsoever. I've never been let down by their spark plugs. I have been let down by other products. I've never been let down by their oil filters. Uh, and uh, it, it really it makes a big difference because labor is uh, a big part of the expense of owning an aircraft. You don't want to change things twice and you don't want problems that can actually damage your engine. And uh, in addition to that, they're always been available, even through the toughest times through uh, the supply chain. So thanks to uh, John and Vince over at Tempest and everything they do for social flight. Now to tonight's featured guest. Ron Machado, uh, Ron Machado is a legendary aviation author, speaker, and flight instructor, combining his unique approach to flight training with his humorous style that makes learning to fly a simpler and more enjoyable journey. As an ATP-rated pilot who still gets excited at flying a Cessna 150 during a flyby, Rod has logged more than 8,000 hours, most of it while giving dual instruction. And I'll tell you, there aren't a lot of pilots who can say that. He has a degree in both aviation science and psychology, which no doubt has led to his unique style of teaching. And if that's not enough, he keeps his students in line with the knowledge that he holds black belts in both Taekwondo and Hokkaido, also having trained over a decade in the Brazilian-based Gracie Jiu-Jitsu. So there's a lot to get into when it comes to talking with Rod. Please help me welcome to Social Flight Live, Rod Machado. Jeff, how are you? How are you doing, sir? I'm doing really well, really well. It's a real honor to be on your show. So. I do appreciate that, and um, uh, thanks for mentioning my Cessna 150. I, you know, the 150, it's a, it's a wonderful airplane. It actually, it's not the fastest airplane in the world, so the way it is, it's, you know, when you fly it for an hour, it kind of seems like a little longer because it goes so slow. So th I think the FAA allows you to log 20% more, and um, I don't quote <laughs> me on that, but, uh, you know, at least that's what I'm thinking about doing. It's, it's kind of like when you go to Alaska, the rules change, you know, when you go into a Cessna 150, you get an extra 10% or 20%. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, they uh, um, Alaska, of course, is one of the very unique places to go fly. And uh, if if you ever want to find and acquire some great stories, go to Alaska and talk to the pilots. And I've been up there many times uh, talking to to pilots. And uh, I was talking to one guy, and uh, I don't know if I mentioned this before, but 
I did a flight instructor course there and uh, we did a safety seminar and I've done this many, many times in Fairbanks and Anchorage and um, one guy in the safety seminar, this was interesting, we were talking about flying and I said, you know, you have to have a flight review and he, he stood up and said, I, I, I've been flying for 4,000 hours and I've been flying for 40 years and I've never heard of this flight review thing and I'm telling you exactly exactly what happened and so well sir you, you know you, when when you get your license every you know two years you have to have a flight review we called it a biennial flight review back then he said license he said i soloed and i've been flying for all that time i i don't have a license why do i need a license this guy had actually soloed his instructor soloed him he had his own airplane and he flew away during the solo I'm not making that up. He's never had an instructor in all those decades, and his instructor probably, you know, didn't go looking for it. But welcome to wonderful Alaska. Strangely, <laughs> uh, I'm not sure if he was followed by the FAA on the way home, but it's the last frontier when it comes to flying airplanes. Well, I think with the loophole, if you're not licensed, the FAA doesn't have many grounds to go after you. Someone else exactly. has to. Yeah, I mean, what are they going to do? Take your fishing license away? Uh, that's no. You 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 can get that back uh, even by taking a written test. I think. Like, what do you do when two mackerel are approaching head on? It's an easy test for the fishing license, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> aviation different story. So you know, one last thing that is that I, I love your affinity for the Cessna 150, and part of the reason for that is. Uh, it wasn't that long ago that I went back and took those kind of first flights with both of my uh, boys, Jake and Ben, when they got their licenses. And it had been forever since I had flown a Cessna 150. Ah, and, interesting. And, and you get so used to kind of like moving the ranks of aircraft and getting more transportation-based cross-country aircraft. Oh my God, I forgot how much fun it is. It, it is. is an absolute joy. It, 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 Jeff, it's insane. And let me tell you, when, when people come out for a flight review, um, I, I I can fly with them in their airplane. And that's all fi fine, well, and good. If they want to fly in my airplane, uh, I'm happy to do it. And here's why. When it comes to flying a Cessna 182, a, a P210, an A36 Bonanza, or something like that, it's wonderful airplanes. Uh, but if you really want to see, whether from a flight instructor's perspective, whether someone... Uh, understands the concept of rudder and aileron coordination and attitude control. You put them in a Cessna 150. Uh, because if, I'll tell you what, any misunderstanding of rudder and aileron use or any lack of skill in rudder and aileron use is magnified dramatically in the Cessna 150. It's uh, very prone to adverse yaw, so you have to be able to crank the rudder in to be able to make the airplane do what you want to do. And added control is the most important thing. So I, I, you can immediately tell the level of skill a person has by putting them in a smaller airplane. And if you really want to go beyond that, you put them in a Piper Cub or a Kit Fox. Any one of those airplanes, are they're so light. The lighter the airplane, the more challenging it is. Yeah. And uh, in, in particular, the, the J3 Cub, though, it requires a, <clears throat> a lot of good stick and rudder skill to be able to fly it properly. Um, so that's what I do. And it's always a great education for anybody that uh, gets a chance to experience the smaller airplane, assuming they can fit, of course. <laughs> True. So that's important. Assuming they can fit and, and you don't look closely too closly at the numbers on your uh, as you do as you're doing yeah. your weight and balance on those. Yeah, well, the, yeah, that's true. There's really not anything to mess up uh, in the weight and balance because you really can't put anything anywhere other than in the main seat. Just got to make sure that you you know don't, don't put too much weight in the main seat, of course. Uh, but uh, everybody has to remain within limits there. But you know the airplane is just an amazing little airplane to fly, especially if it 150, not the 152, which is a great airplane. Don't get me wrong. I like the 150 because with the 40 degrees of Fowler like flaps uh, I, the the airplane comes out of the air if you want it to uh, at an amazing rate and <clears throat> if you're ever high and you have to get the airplane down that airplane can be uh, will do some amazing things on the descent as long as you don't exceed the maximum flap extended speed on it wow so let's let's mm -hmm. you know part of the program is look back on on 2023 look forward on 2024 how was how was your 2023 now that it's over oh it was um it was great from you know my perspective, uh, Jeff. You know I spent most of my time creating new e-courses. Uh, I updated my private pilot book to a private commercial book, and 
instead of being 650 pages, now it's uh, 704 pages. So I keep making it bigger and uh, pretty soon it'll be so big you won't be able to carry it in the airplane with you. And if you do and you need more climb rate, you just throw it out. But it's, it, it, so I've been doing a lot of that. And let's see, uh, Diane and I, we, we enjoyed flying the airplane. I, I've had several flight review students and proficiency flights is what I've done the most. So I, I do enjoy that, but I keep pretty busy working on my products. And oh, one thing we did, Diane and I took a dance course. Uh, I thought we would uh, increase our dance skill since uh, um, it's easy for me to do because I don't have any. <clears throat> Every time I go dancing, people come up and look for my medic alert bracelet. It's very embarrassing. So uh, what I, I do is I decided I'm going to change that. So we did. So we went to a nice dance place in San Clemente. And unfortunately, there was a, uh, a place. It was in the uh, community hall and in the room next door. They were teaching a karate class. And one of the karate guys got mixed up, came into the dance class and started kicking and punching all the dancers. So we had to get him out of there. And uh, so but we, we managed to survive. So that's a, how about you? Did you have a great uh, 2023? Excellent. Excellent 2023. I, you know, one of the challenges, and I'm curious about your thoughts on this, is, of course, it was very bittersweet. There was a lot of good things that happened, but we also lost uh, quite a few uh, close friends and, and other people, people who have been on the show, other people who were, uh, who were quite prominent and well-known in aviation. And um, I think that it, it, to some, it may, may seem that that it was a tough year on GA. And I haven't seen the statistics to know if it really was widespread or if it was just from those notable incidents. But um, I'm very curious about your thoughts on, on that. Well, it's a, that's a great question. And uh, certainly we're, we're obviously referencing a, a number of prominent people here. And we'll take the, the one that people are probably most familiar with, right now, and that is Richard McSpadden. And, uh, and I knew Richard uh, working at uh, AOPA, and uh, <laughs> they don't come in any better than that. The man was quite the uh, maven of safety and uh, uh, with incredible skill and capabilities. And here's the interesting thing, though. When you lose somebody of that caliber of skill and proficiency and um, awareness and insight, what that does is it's like a blow to the knees to every other pilot that wants to fly uh, safely. And what happens is when a person first, and, and I thought about this a great deal, I even wrote an article on it, I've not published it yet. I wanted to make sure I got this right. So, uh, you know, I trade ideas between different pilots to see how they feel about this, just to make sure I'm on track. But <clears throat> it seems to me that when we first hear something like that. The question we ask ourselves is, if it could happen to him, could it happen to me? And the obvious answer to that is yes. We don't even, even have to think about asking that question. In, in other words, uh, the mind is so desperate, and this is a very important aspect about the human mind. The mind is so desperate to find an answer to something, irrespective as to whether that answer is correct or not. It just has to seem correct to you. And when we heard, uh, when we heard that uh, Richard McSpadden was, was lost in an aviation accident, we ask ourselves, oh my gosh, if that could happen to him, could it happen to me? So that's the simple question we always ask. The better question to have asked is, would I have taken the same risks that Richard McSpadden took when he departed? Now, it's quite possible that uh, some of the risks just were not accessible. And that does happen because sometimes Mother Nature acts in very, very peculiar ways and you can't access all the risks. Risk. Sometimes you just have bad luck and there's nothing you can do about it. But the point is that the question you should have asked yourself, the question that we, sh we should have asked ourselves, would I have taken the same risk? And the answer to that is, when you first heard about the accident is, I don't know. I don't know if I would have, because I don't know what risks he took. And that's the key, because according to uh, Daniel um, um, a, a Kaufman in his book, Think Fast, Think Slow, we have a fast thinking mind and a slow thinking mind. Slow thinking mind is the logical mind, and it's the one that we want to use to deal with difficult problems. And the fast thinking mind is the one that we just immediately uh, use to answer questions. So 
Had we uh, used or engaged our slow thinking mind and asked not the question that's easy to answer, would that happen to me? Because obviously, yes, it could happen to me. Uh, we would have been better off by asking, would I have taken the same risks? And then our logical mind, slow thinking mind kicks in. And then we start to think, okay, well, before I feel bad unnecessarily, other than just the loss of humanity of losing a man of that caliber, and, and many other like him, uh, of course, uh, that I, I haven't mentioned, but the point is that we would have been, we would have done a better service for ourselves. I think. Engaging in the slow thinking mind, would I have made, taken the same risks that this gentleman took uh, yeah. that was uh, lost in an airplane crash? Does that make sense? Did that it, kind it of does. Uh, speak uh, it, to you? It, it does. I, I'm curious, as as an instructor, a leader, and a writer, what what your thoughts are on how you how you teach risk to students and how you convey some of that because it it seems to me when I look back myself the the most prominent things in my memory that have changed my behavior are either uh, decisions I made that I shouldn't have and have learned from and feel lucky to have escaped and therefore will never take the rat risk again mm -hmm. or something that I made a smart decision on that it was hard to make and that was confirmed somehow like mm -hmm. uh, you know a flight I uh, recently where we decided to stay over um, and and not return and it was a tough decision to make but then another pilot uh, uh, crashed that night trying to get into that airport what we were thinking about you know, uh, toying with. And, sure. and that, that leaves me with a success. I'm glad about it. Um, but the same thing, it's burned into my memory for that reason as well. Students yeah. don't have yeah. that. Young pilots don't have that. And, and many other, there, I'm sure there's a hundred, you know, thousands of gaps in my own areas where I haven't filled them with that. So how do you, how do you conv convey that? Well, it's a very good question. You always ask great questions and uh, I, I, I like them. And this is a very, very good one. Um, and it is interesting. We have our own self-governing mechanism, and it's uh, it's called the recognition of the unfamiliar. When we're flying an airplane, when we see something that is unfamiliar, such as oh my gosh, there's there's a thunderstorm uh, sitting right over the airport, and we've never seen something like that before. That's unfamiliar. Familiar. And if we attend to that and pay attention to that, then we can engage our self-questioning mode and say, okay, what do I not, what, I, what do I know about this? What do I not know about this? Uh, but th that is a very important governor for us. And most people with common sense will recognize things that are unfamiliar that might be a hazard. And that's the key. Because if I go out to my airplane, my airplane is banging up and down on the ground and they've never seen something like that before. They don't have to be told that that wind may be too strong for them to fly at. There's just an intuitive sense um, that we have as uh, as human beings, you know, the basic common sense that makes us question whether, hey, is this a really good idea to, to engage in? So you have to really have respect for your own uh, awareness of the recognition of that which is unfamiliar and possibly a hazard. But getting back to risk, uh, risk assessment is what was used by uh, Richard Feynman when the, uh, sh the uh, Challenger crashed in 1980, and he was on the uh, discovery panel or on the panel that researched the reason for the crash. And uh, you know, they found out the O-rings had frozen and so on and so forth. And that, that's an important thing. But what NASA conveyed in that, um, uh, in that meeting was, or in that uh, uh, f final meeting they had, was that they, the shuttle was expected to crash on one out of every 100 flights. That's what they expected. And so far, that's pretty much what they had. The thing is, NASA did a risk assessment using uh, probable, probabilistic models and a tremendous amount of math and data, and that's how they calculated risks. Human beings without experience don't calculate risk. There's mm -hmm. absolutely no math involved in this. For somebody with a lot of experience, and their episodic memory and all the collection of data they have, 20,000 hours of experience, they can make those kind of uh, probabilistic assessments. But the, uh, the uh, less experience you have, the more recognition you have to have of dangers or hazards instead of risks. 
And that's very, very important. So you don't focus on the risk, you focus on the danger, the hazard. And right. isn't it interesting that all the things that we learn in ground school, <clears throat> excuse me, or if we did learn them in ground school, focused on the dangers and risks that you should be aware of. Oh, exceeding the critical angle of attack. <clears throat> oh, stalling close to the ground. Oh, running out of fuel and so on and so forth. All those things, anybody, who's ever gone through ground school and uh, yay for them if they went through a really good ground school or read a good aviation book and they attended to it will have a collection of assessments that represent the hazards that they have to attend to forget the risk you know we we really oversold this idea for risks uh for inexperienced pilots and you know I, I really appreciate people try to do the best job they can and they promote the you know, risk assessment products. But if you really want to focus on something that is going to give you more bang for the buck, uh, and, that, and that would be studying good ground school material, reading good aviation books, you know, Richard Buck's uh, Weather Flying and uh, uh, books by Richard Collins and the, all these other just wonderful, wonderful books that people can read that, um, you know, Fate is the Hunter is actually a pretty interesting book to, to read. Wind, Sand and Stars by Antoine de saint uh one of the most beautiful poetic books that has ever been written about aviation. And there's more psychology packed into that book uh, that is uh, so unrecognized. As a matter of fact, I even did, if I'm talking too much, just let me know. <laughs> Oh no, I, I love it. <laughs> just, just smack me down there. I, that's how, that's how you get my attention. That's how it worked in Catholic school for me. But um, in Wind, Sand, and Stars, um, Antoine de saint um talked about the psychology of flying, but he talked about it as a poet would talk about it. And it's interesting. The poets convey that same knowledge that psychologists do. It's just when the poet says it, it's just a lot more interesting to listen to. So. The, the answer to your question in my roundabout elliptical nonlinear sort of way is the hazards are what you focus on. You get that from ground school. Leave the risks assessment for the ATPs after they've acquired 10,000, 20,000 hours of flying. Then when you get that much experience, you'll be able to have uh, the, uh, the analog of the, a gray supercomputer, a cray supercomputer, I'm sorry. They're in different colors now. Uh, and you'll be able to make those kind of assessments just based on your memory of events, your episodic memory, memory of memory of stories, things that have happened. You can't do that as a private pilot. What what types of things do you do though as an instructor, uh, personally you, that, that help kind of give students an idea of what some, a little taste of what something's like to get into that you, you know at some point they're likely to encounter and you want them to kind of get a vibe for what what is low visibility or what are ceilings or what is this or what is, you know, whatever it is. Um, mm -hmm. What kind of things do you do for that? Well, that's a, again, another another great question. Um, the uh, And by the way, I just want to say this is iced tea, all right? Just be clear <laughs> about that. I, I naturally uh, become way too excited when I talk about aviation because it's the most fun to talk about. Um, the uh, a good instructor, a good flight instructor, and, and there are so many great instructors out there. Unfortunately, there are so many bad instructors too, and they give all the good instructors such a bad name. You know, uh, you you have instructors like David St. George, uh, Rich Stoll, and 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 uh, people. And I apologize for not being able to mention even even a, a, a small number of the great great instructors that are out there. Uh, but this is what these guys do. The they put them in an airplane, and they, if they can't give them direct experience, they simulate that experience. As a matter of fact, in the FA's handbook, I got it right here. This is the FA Flight Instructor Handbook, 1969 version. This is one of the best books on flight instruction I have ever read. Now, the FA's got a brand new book out, and it's on the Flight Instructor's Handbook. It's three times as thick as that, and uh, it's okay. But when it comes right down to meat and potatoes, bang for the buck, go on the internet, see if you can find a copy of this book and get the PDF or something. And uh, because the teaching material in there is powerful. And what the FA says in that book is to simulate the experience you cannot give directly. That's why, you know, with, with a student, if you're flying with me I'll, at the right time, right place, 
I'll reach over, pull your throttle back. <clears throat> Everybody does this now, of course, and I'll say, your engine has just quit. Now, some of the brighter students will say, no, it, it didn't look. Somebody pull back the throttle, and they'll push the throttle in, okay, because, you know, that's the way my students are. They're very playful. But uh, we simu simulate engine failure, and that's one way. But of course, you know, that, and, and that's a very common thing. And you should do that so you find a place to land the airplane, go through the procedures, best glide speed, re engine restart, and what have you. <clears throat> but things like stalls, you know, the airplane can stall in such a way that you may not see it coming. As a matter of fact, in a NASA study that was done many years ago, I think it was done in the mid-1970s, NASA uh, was a study on stall spin. NASA said that in 75%, of the stall spin accidents where the pilot survived. And again, 75% of the stall spin accidents where the pilot survived, in 75% of those instances, the surviving pilot did not hear the stall warning horn go on. Now that's powerful stuff. And the mm. FA, of course, has a big move afoot to train people to become aware of the stall warning horn, uh, but it just doesn't work that way. Uh, the most effective means of recognizing a stall is a, is a stick shaker. It's not a stall horn. That mm. noise just fades into the background. It's it's uh, that's just the way the human brain works. However, however, um, you can simulate this, and I do this with my student. It, it's, a, it's really a, it, an interesting thing to do, tremendously entertaining for the flight instructor. I'll start the student at 3,000 feet, let's say, or 4,000 feet. I'll say, okay, this is what I want you to do. I wanna make a power off, descent, throttle, mixture, I'm sorry, uh, carb heat on, power all the way back. I want you to descend, let's take in the 150, at 65 knots. And I want you to descend at 65 knots until you reach 3,000 feet. And then I want you to hold the uh, uh, altitude with the elevator control only. Only the elevator control. And as the student's descending, I'll say, okay, are you maintaining your heading? Yes. Are you uh, maintaining your, uh, are, are you, you're in the descent? Are you getting close to 3,000 feet? Yes. What are you going to do at 3,000 feet? Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hold the altitude with the elevator control only. I'm distracting him from paying attention to his airspeed. And when he gets to 3,000 feet, Jeff, eight out of 10 times, this is what they do. They reach over, they continue to pull back on the elevator control. The stall warning horn is blurring. That altimeter needle is completely uh, frozen because they're looking right at it. They stall and they have no idea that they're stalling. Man, that is powerful. Because I've had students sit there and just hold the airplane in a stall until I say, you're in a stall. Recover from the stall. And I have to cue them in to actually do that. And once that happens, once they could see how easy it is for them to um, not use their training, training they have in recovering from stall, because they, they can't get past the stunned response in this uh -huh. case, or the startle response, as uh, has been aptly named recently, then uh, they learn that, and then they change. A, a dramatic uh, ped <clears throat> pedagogical shift, learning shift takes place in their psyche, and I'll tell you, that's uh, money can't buy that kind of experience w when it happens to them. But then there are, there are a lot of things like that, too. You know, um, simulating icing conditions with a student during IFR flight. I'll say, uh, put the hood on and, and I'll, I'll say, OK, uh, open up your sectional chart. You're picking up ice. You're going down. Find me a place to put this airplane down. You have a 500 foot ceiling um, above ground level. And I start retarding the throttle. Uh, 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 Let's see, how do I normally do this? It depends on the kind of airplane, but normally I'll pull the throttle back and I'll uh, reduce the manifold pressure one minute, uh, one ma inch of manifold pressure for every minute that goes by or 100 RPM for every minute that goes by, which gives them about, you know, maybe about uh, seven to eight minutes of effective time to find a place where they can descend over and get below the 500 foot overcast. So there, there are quite a few things that flight instructors can do, tricks in the bag, so to speak, to help train that. If you have a good instructor, uh, you'll come away with a tremendous education uh, as a result of that instructor's acumen and knowledge. That makes a lot of sense. And, and you know, one of the things that uh, I think it would be wonderful if flight instructors, and then quite frankly, even when people are, are already licensed, uh, would have the opportunity to do with a qualified instructor, uh, is to experience 
some of the conditions so they can kind of actually translate. What, is, what do these numbers look like? Like, okay, there's a big difference between, you know, an eight to 10 or 10 mile visibility and five oh, or yeah, three. Very, like, or, or one, which is perfectly yeah, legal. One. What, what does it really look, even if you're just a passenger for it, what does it really look like so that when you see that number, and you've got get homitis, or you're thinking about it, or you're trying to get to a certain airport, you really know what it's going to, you know, at best, what it's going to look like. Yes, yes. Well, think about this, that one mile visibility is the lowest visibility that you can legally fly in as a VFR pilot in Class G airspace, or for that matter, under special VFR conditions when departing a, a surface-based controlled airspace. And yet, one mile visibility is the minima on most very non-precision approach charts where you have a, uh, a, a very you know, non-precise means of navigation, less than precise, like an NDB approach uh, in this case. One mile visibility can and can be the lowest minimums that are available to an instrument pilot. So you're basically flying with, uh, in VFR conditions with the same minima that an IFR pilot might be flying in in order to be able to find the airport and uh, the the you know the best way to to be able to handle that other than dirtying up a student's glasses which doesn't work i've tried everything uh, really i've i've tried everything it just the best <laughs> way to do it believe me i've i thought of a lot of creative ways to simulate low visibility is to wait for a low visibility condition and go up and do traffic pattern work Mm -hmm. That's the thing to do. Um, you can do that at a Class G airport, let's say, uh, you know, where you pay attention to any instrument approaches that may be coming into the airport. You have to be careful because people may make instrument approaches and you're up there doing touch and goes, which, by the way, you can do touch and goes in many cases with a 700 foot ceiling, one mile visibility uh, during the day. Not that that may be the wisest thing to do, but it is doable and it can be done safely. Absolutely, uh, as long as the flight instructor is aware of uh, the hazards, not the risks, the hazards, and where right. those hazards, what those hazards are. Very important to use that term. Um, but but the uh, the deal is when you see what, what it's like to fly with one mile visibility, your whole perspective changes, and right. now you think, oh my gosh, you know, a one mile visibility. If I'm flying at 60 knots, I'm moving at one mile per minute, 90 knots, one and a half miles per minute. So. Uh, things, a lot of things can happen in one minute and uh, that it, things change. And if you can't see more than one minute ahead of you in this case, that's, that's real sobering, but it takes again, a flight instructor that's willing to do that. I did that with my students, uh, IFR students. We'd always go up and fly in reasonable weather and in Southern California, uh, well, IFR weather. And, and, and to be fair, flying IFR in Southern California, it's not like flying IFR in Tucson, Arizona. Uh, there's that's an entirely different type of experience because you're dealing with a lot of convective weather. So, you know, fortunately in California, you, you get all kind of weather, but you get a lot of low stratus clouds and what have you. So all my primary students and IFR students got a lot of actual time, especially during June, the June gloom conditions, as we used to call it. In fact, it was so much uh, low stratus out here during June that uh, by the end of June, when the sun came out, people were reported as a UFO. <laughs> so it's just you know, part of what happens in Southern California. But um, uh, so I, I agree with you to, to get that experience. Sometimes you just need to go out and get the practical experience. And Doug Stewart uh, takes a very famous, well-known flight instructor, takes students from the Northeast uh, down to the Southeast, you know, from the New England corridor all the way down to Florida. And uh, he'll take them in all kind of weather and they uh, fly IFR with him and they it's one of the best experiences a student can have. So you'd look up Doug Stewart, you can go to SAFE, uh, Society of Aviation Flight Instructors and Educators and you can find him that way and uh, you get your money worth flying with Doug. Yeah. That's, that's, you know, you brought up something else too, which is when you're, when you're looking at visibility or what the ability, the things that you are legally allowed to do, uh, even without an instrument created uh, in VFR conditions. Well, that includes night flying, of course. And boy, is that a situation that you can get yourself into uh, uh, visibility problems and you don't see it coming. That's a, that's a very, very good observation. You know, driving at night is far more dangerous than uh, far more hazards 
to deal with than flying or driving during the day. I'm talking about driving a car now. And ev even if you pre-inflate the airbags, uh, <laughs> it's still, no, you can't do that. Okay. I, I tried. Uh, but think about flying, flying three times more accidents at night during the day. So a uh, big surprise. And the reason for that is, oh yeah, it's dark. It gets dark at night, and if you don't have a moon to supplement whatever surface reflection uh, you may have uh, or surface lighting that's available, it makes it very, very difficult to uh, obviously uh, put an airplane down in the event of emergency. It makes it difficult to uh, uh, identify landmarks or, heaven forbid, if you're flying out over the water, well, not heaven forbid, Am I too, was that too dramatic? It's like, <laughs> it's like I'm trying to. Yeah, we've okay. got really good places to fly out over the water to here. <laughs> yeah, well, um, yeah, I apologize for my dramaticism. I get so excited about it. Anyway, uh, yeah, if you're flying California, you know, you fly it over the water, you're out of the coast. You don't have, there's, there is no surface lighting down there except for a couple boats, uh, but uh, you don't want to trust them. And so what happens is you, it, you lose your horizon. And that, that is one of the ways that I used to go out and induce vertigo to primary students, to student pilots. And once you get that type of spatial disorientation, it's really, and believe me, as a flight instructor, I have to fight my same vertigo response because it's just as easy for me to get vertigo, uh, spatial disorientation, except I, I obviously don't lose control of the airplane, but I want them to experience what's that, what that is like. And you don't have to do fancy maneuvers, put them out over the water, have them make some turns, and that's how that works. But it, here's, the, here's the point. Uh, there's certain things that you really want to consider not doing at night. And it's like certain things you want to consider not during the day, do, doing during the day. Not every airport is the safest airport to land based on the airplane you fly and the skill level uh, that you may possess. There's some airports that are so short, and if you fly a high-performance airplane into that airport and you have any problem on takeoff uh, or you don't manage your airspeed properly on landing, uh, it's bad juju for you. Mm -hmm. So this is where knowing your own limitations uh, becomes such an important factor. But at night, you really have to up your game in that regard. In other words, that self-awareness uh, of your own level of proficiency, and in particular, the airports you're going into. You know, flying over the mountains at night. Well, first of all, if, if you're flying over open terrain at night and you have an engine failure, then um, there, all I can say is... Um, you know, so sorry, better luck next time. You know, there's, <laughs> what are you gonna do? You know, yeah, you turn on the landing light, that, that doesn't work. But the point is that that makes it very tough. However, you can reduce the potential hazard by taking and going at night and flying from one airport to the next, to the next, to the next. Now you can do that in California, because we have airports all over the place. And so you can plan that. Like if I'm going to Catalina from, Cal from Orange County Airport and I'm going to Catalina 26 miles across the sea, I have to get to 8,000 feet so that under calm wind conditions, my engine quits, I can glide to Catalina or glide back to the mainland. So I may think strategically like that if I'm flying at night. I'll just fly from over one airport to the next, to the next. I'm flying over the airports high enough so I could go to that airport and land. Oh, but that also presupposes a special skill. And that is that uh, I, I'm able to descend over the airport at uh, less than a 45 degree bank. 30 degrees of bank is all you need. And you descend under controlled conditions over the airport because there are no mountains directly above the airport. To the best of my knowledge, I could be wrong. Uh, and if so, I stand corrected. So then you descend down right into the traffic pattern and land, which by the way, is something I also practice with my students. And we do it out over at Corona, which is a great place to do that kind of practice because there's there are mountains around there. but Again, following circling down over the airport. And um, then, of course, the final one is if you're going to go, like uh, Diane and I are going to go out to Las Vegas here soon, and we're going to take the Cessna 150 Landomatic. And what I'll do is I'll follow the major, I think it's I 95, going right out uh, to, and it's over, you know, high desert. But the point is, I'm going to follow the, the freeway. And if my engine quits, uh, I, I, I will just use the BLS to land the aircraft and the BLS is the Buick lighting system and uh, that will allow me to better lot land the airplane. There are very few power lines that go across uh, the uh, the freeway compared to 
urban and rural settings. So you don't have to worry about those as much. You know, they, they're still out there, but the thing is uh, you really up the odds for a successful emergency landing. And uh, so, you know, there, there are just a lot of things you could, Jeff, and all the time I've been flying, I, you know, it's amazing when when you think about it, people say, what would you do in this situation? And not because I'm so smart, but because I've asked a lot of questions of pilots over the years, I would say, do this. I, I used to do this in my handling in-flight emergency program. And I would give you the answers that other people have told me based on their experience, what they've done, or what I personally experienced myself. There's always something you can do to handle a problem. And then somebody's gonna say in class, what happens if a wing falls off? And I say, well, here's what you do about it. Don't worry about it because there's nothing you can do about it to prevent it for the most part if you keep your airplane maintained. And once it happens, if the left wing falls off and the right wing is still on, you just better hope the tower will give you left traffic. You know, <laughs> what can I say? You're clear for right traffic. I don't have a left wing, so I can't do left traffic. <laughs> You know, and I hate to be so blunt about it. I mean, it's a serious thing. It just doesn't happen. It's so yeah. rare for something like that. So, so why even think about it? You know, right. it, it doesn't make sense. One of the things that comes to mind for me, I'm curious about how, how you teach, it involves, uh, I think it, it tends to bite a lot of pilots that aren't students that have been flying for a while. And that's kind of the complacency or the confirmation bias or expectation bias of, of what they're doing. And um, I was... I was a victim of this in a car recently, so so I'm especially interested in in this. When I go to back out of my my car for some reason, uh, things nearby, I'm used to hearing the the little beeps go off for the just as I'm exiting the garage, um, and then once I clear it, they don't go off for saying that there's anything behind me. So I I, I got used to that. Well, then everybody, Jake and Ben, everybody comes home for, for the uh, Thanksgiving for the holidays. I do that. I hear the beeps, crunch. I didn't realize, you know, because I wasn't paying attention. It didn't matter to me anymore because the expectation was there's nothing actually behind me. Sure. Um, this seems to show up in the NTSB reports uh, on a fairly regular basis that people are used to doing things a certain way or, or, or hearing things or switching things and they don't pay attention when something's different. Mm. Yeah, it's a, you, again, you, you make great observations. Um, Think about this. When somebody goes out into the street and they get run over by a car, there are only three possibilities. Number one, they, on some sort of Freudian level, they wanted to get run over by a car. Yeah, not likely. <laughs> Number two, on some sort of um, cosmic or karmic level, they needed to get hit by a car. Yeah, I don't think that's the case. Or the third possibility is they didn't pay attention when they went out in the street. I think I'm going with item or door number three. And the idea of paying attention is is really is really the key. And, and in fact, it is so fundamental. I haven't figured out how to make it uh, how to make the story of paying attention so unique, so powerful on some sort of Shakespearean level that when people hear it, they are awed by the, the cadence and pace and colorful use of language because it's just so obvious, but it's just something that people don't give the proper weight to. And uh, let me further explain. Um, Harry Lorraine, in a book, actually, we were talking about just before we uh, we went went live here. Harry, L Harry Lorraine, L-O-R-A-Y-N-E, I believe, wrote a book called The Memory Book. And in that book, he said, it's a powerful statement. He said, you cannot forget something uh, of which you were originally aware. Originally aware. And what original awareness means is that you stop and you say, okay, this is important. I'm going to pay attention to it. And that is called original awareness. Now, that requires self-reflective thinking. In other words, hey, I, me, the I, me is going to pay attention to it. The it thing, that's important. So um, the, the question is, how do we get ourselves to pay attention to the things that are important? And, uh, and I'll give you a powerful story for this that happened to me. Um, we live up on a, on a slope down below 
there uh, is a, a, a small track of homes. And one day, 11 o'clock in the morning, I came out and I saw smoke coming from one of the homes. So I go, oh my God, because you know, that's the slope people live down there. So that's, that's what I called the story I wrote this about. So I thought, oh my gosh, I got to go down there. I, I got to help the folks. They don't realize their house is on fire. I run down. Turns out the, the, nobody could find where the fire was coming from. Okay, fine. So I knocked on about seven or eight doors. They all thought I was crazy. So I came back home, walked up the hill, back into the house. 30 minutes later, I look out, I saw more smoke. I thought, oh no, it's a, it's a delay release smoke fire. So I run down again. And as I'm running down the hill, I stopped and I thought, I'm going to be so embarrassed. I'm going to get in so much trouble. And I, do I really want to do this? And then I asked myself this question. And here's the question. I said, what is the right thing to do? And immediately I knew the answer. And the reason I knew the answer is because my training kicked in. Let's call it my moral ethical training kicked in. Yeah, it doesn't matter if I'm embarrassed. That's the right thing to do. So I ran down there and seven or eight doors and what have you. And they all thought I was honest. They thought I was crazy. I got scrapes on my face from the bushes and everything. I looked like a madman going down there and there was no fire. And we have yet to figure out where it came from. But, you know, I did my civic duty. Asking ourselves selves, self-referential questions is the key. And I'll give you an example of that. Several weeks ago, I flew with a friend of mine and he is a one of the most competent pilots I've ever flown with, but he and I have a disadvantage when we fly. He's a professional comedian, a, a world-class ma magician, an insanely competent pilot, and uh, of course, I made my living as a humor, aviation humorist for many, many years. And when you put two of us in together, you can imagine uh, the uh, potential for not paying attention. So what I have to do is to purposely engage that self-referential thinking and say to myself, okay, uh, when I'm on the ground, where am I going? How do I get there? What do I do next? What's the taxiway I'm going to? Oh, it's taxiway hotel. Uh, I got to write that down. Make sure I know exactly where that's at. What's the route to taxiway hotel? And I'm doing all these things in the back of my mind. And I'll guarantee you, I'll guarantee you, if I forget to do that, I so easily can be swept up in the, uh, let's say, the euphoria of flying with, with my buddy, who I dearly enjoy flying with. Um, and so, and even with my wife, we have such a great time when we fly, it's easy to get carried away and not pay attention. So I have to focus myself. It's asking questions. What's the right thing to do? Where am I going? How do I get there? What do I do next? Or as I do with my students, tap them on the shoulder and say, uh, and I'll, I'll do this in the traffic pattern, IFR students, I do this, you know, six, seven times a minimum a flight. What are the next two things? And the student will give me the answer. What are the next two things you have to do? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, I got to uh, uh, connect the Hobbs meter back up and uh, say we're going to be late. And <laughs> you know, whatever. They, they come up with weird things because they have a good sense of humor. And uh, if I'm making an instrument approach, I'll say how low, how long, which way. I have a series of things that I ask that give me the information uh, that I need, that guide me, because the mind is so mercurial, it's so easy to get distracted, and um, quite honestly, the older you get, the easier it is to get distracted, and that's just a, a function of the aging mind. And I know for me, I, I have to work very hard not to get distracted. So, um, and I have a tool for that, and the tool is self-referential questions. And by the way, People know how to use these because the whole basis of applying a, a hazardous attitude antidote requires you to recognize the hazardous attitudes you have. So you have to be self-referential that way. But the, ad, 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 the antidote is, okay, um, uh, wh what do I have to do to stop being aggressive? What's the right thing to do? How do I handle my anti uh, or my aggressiveness uh, and apply that antidote that way. In other words, uh, for aggression, it would, it, uh, for anti-authority, let's say, uh, the rules are often right, follow the rules. They're not always right, but they probably are right in this instance. So, uh, you know, that's my response uh, to your, to your <laughs> point. Awesome. It's, it, it's so powerful, this, this idea of self-referential questions and guiding the mind. The, 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 the mind is like, it's like a puppy dog, you know, you, uh, it's, it, it sees uh, something uh, sparkly and shiny. If it looks like a bone, that's even worse, and it's off after it. So 
you know, that's how it works. That is so cool. Um, let's switch gears for a second, because with with one of the things that's been big news in 23 and going to be bigger news probably in 24 is artificial intelligence mm. and what we have started to see AI affecting so many different things. <laughs> that's so true. What do you think that AI is going to do to flight training? Yeah, that's a, as a matter of fact, I, I, I added about two pages. I, I wrote two pages on AI uh, in, in reference to simulators in flight in an article I wrote uh, on the flight instructor problem. Oop, excuse me. Oops. I just pulled my microphone out of my ear. Oops. There's a word you never want to hear in a tattoo parlor. Oops. <laughs> okay, sorry. Sorry about that. Um, so the, uh, the the blog article I wrote, you can read it at rodmachado.com. It's the newest blog on that uh, piece. But um, here's a here's a prediction for you. People say, oh my gosh, you know, there's never going to be a case where a person flies in an aircraft without a pilot. Well, there already is. The Chinese call it the E-Hang uh, mobile transport system. Yeah, e hey, it's E H A N G E hang, and it's a, 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 a basically a, a, a VTOL aircraft, <clears throat> all electric, flies you to ever anywhere you want to go within a 15 minute radius, a flight radius. I call it the E hang on. That's really what they should call it, the E E hang on. But um, the simulators we have nowadays, let's take one of the more sophisticated uh, simulators, the Redbird simulator, uh, or any of the other great simulators that are around but the red redbird is is a movable redbird is a movable simulator it gives you that sensation of being real you know in the aircraft not that you need that but hey if you can get it take it i claim that you'll be able to teach a pilot a, a pilot will be able to self teach himself or herself how to fly at least to a point of acquisition of 80% of the skills <clears throat> maybe even more uh, by using artificial intelligence as an instructor platform. You take artificial intelligence, let's say on the level of chat GPT, even four right now, or chat GPT-5, or, uh, um, or general artificial intelligence, which is up and coming. And, and it's, it would be like having a real flight instructor that teaches you how to fly. And folks, you can do this on a desktop simulator. You don't even need the fancy simulator. Like, and I know this for a fact because I've seen it done. I know ex exact cases where it has been done at Cypress College. And the instructor there uses uh, the Microsoft Flight Simulator uh, with his great uh, Ed, Ed uh, Valdez. Captain Ed Valdez is the instructor there. And he's, he's just an insanely good instructor too. And his students take one semester course and one of his students at the end of the semester course went out and flew a demo flight, took the airplane off, flew the airplane around, came back and landed and the instructor never had to touch anything. And he had never, uh, I'm sorry, I, I stand corrected. The student had only had one demo flight before that. So on the second demo flight, he did everything by himself. And that is going to be the rule, not the exception. Artificial intelligence can do that. It, it will replace the instructor um, to the extent that 85, maybe even 90% of the training can be done by the student on his own or her own. And the, the flight instructor then does the finish up the uh, final polish or gives the essential training that cannot be provided uh, a, a, by a simulator um, and you know, flight training device, advanced flight training device. But it may be scheduled so that maybe the student flies with the uh, instructor after five hours of self-training. I'm not sure how the uh, schedule of, of uh, training and reinforcement will take place there. I haven't really thought about how to do that, but let me tell you, it's already been done. It's, it's already been done. And wow. that was done back in 2004 with the uh, first issue of the flight training lessons in Microsoft Flight Simulator, which by the way, I wrote. I wrote those lessons and they used basic software, nothing even close to what artificial intelligence or let's say uh, artificial uh, uh, chat GPT 3.5 or chat GPT 4, which defined the, the current level of uh, availability of artificial intelligence for use by the general public. 
I think it's chat, chat G, GPT-5 now, but um, that was just software built into the program and it offered feedback. And uh, the feedback was, I would say to them, okay, um, you're doing well, pull the nose up. You need to go over here, add some power here. And, and it was great. And one cute story there, one, one father was flying the simulator. He was taking my lesson. I'm talking to him. Okay, looking good. Okay, a little more nose up. You're losing a little altitude there. And the son is right next to him, totally focused on the simulator. And he's watching his dad and his son's getting all into his dad doing a great job. And I said, okay, you're losing altitude now. You need to pull the nose up. It's time to pull the nose up, preferably today. The nose may not be available tomorrow. I had a bunch of humor in there. Pull the nose up now. And the kid yelled into this computer screen, he's doing it, TV man. And uh, because, you know, his dad wasn't really doing it as well as uh, as quick as I needed him to do it. But I, I just love that. He's doing it, TV man. <laughs> That's how it works. I I love that and I and I have used that and I love the fact that you created the courses and that you're part of all of that uh, out there. Do you, you know? Oh, and, and by the way, let me just say say this if I can. You have to give credit to the team at Microsoft because those guys were they developed a cutting edge program that uh, it was not available at the time. Yeah. Nobody thought they could actually do that. And of course, those guys over there are so insanely smart. Bruce Williams and um, and Kat and all those other uh, wonderful folks that are available. So uh, there and, you know, that was their masterwork. So anyway, I'm sorry. Didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, no, no problem. It's very, very, very true. Um, do you think that artificial intelligence and its impact on on aviation, especially on flight training, will be similar to other technologies that have come along where it it <clears throat> kind of takes over a whole bunch of things that could be kind of automated and it moves the professionals in the industry towards the higher end and and, and just towards refining skills or be or imparting even more uh kind of intelligence around it uh and, and sensitivity around it or do you think this is so revolutionary that Pilots, uh, it's going to make it possible for pilots to to be to get the AI will have perception and will be able to teach them in ways that will exceed what we've been able to do. Um, I I think that if I if I understand your question correctly, I, I will AI be able to assist the pilot perhaps in improving the pilot's skill. Uh, and raising their, elevating their level of performance and proficiency um, and making pilots better. And we're talking about professional pilots here. I'm well, yeah, yes, or I'm actually All asking, pilots. will its existence actually make flight training far better oh, 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 than, oh, it yes, is, yes. Oh, than, without, it is, than it is today? Without a doubt, without a, without a doubt. You know, computers don't yell at you. Computers don't, uh, you know, <laughs> stop flying, stop training you to call their girlfriend on a telephone, uh, which, by the way, happens more frequently than you might uh, than you might think. Uh, I get all the horror stories, by the way. Uh, so I I I I'm I'm in the know, so to speak. About everybody writes me and tells me about the crazy things that happened to them, and I want them to do that. I I I want to hear this stuff. It's my job. So yes, it'll make flight instructors, uh, it'll make the training experience a lot better. I don't see how it can. not It's certainly not going to make it any worse. I cannot imagine how that can happen. Now, don't get me wrong. There is a, uh, th there's one thing a computer can't convey, and that is this idea of, uh, of uh, building confidence in you or you cannot have, it's, it's hard to develop trust in something that is an inanimate object. It's hard to develop trust uh, in something that's just uh, uh, circuits and uh, integrated circuits and, uh, you know, quantum computing and things like that. It, it, we like to be near a human being because human being gives us confidence. So I, I don't, AI is not going to replace the human being in my profession. But what it will do is it will compensate for um, the, uh, the things that the bad flight instructors bring to the table when they train their students. I think that's the best way. Unfortunately, there are just a lot of bad instructors and, and there are a lot of good instructors too. But some instructor would rather be uh, building time, 
to get to the airlines and not pay attention to their students. It's always been a, a problem. There's a recent example of that in Kentucky where a student took off and with his instructor and the instructor flew him right into a, a thunderstorm while he was berating him and filming him. And that's the exception rather than the rule though, but it does happen and AI is not gonna do that. So there's the building of skills early in the training area and there's a good CFI, more good CFIs will be available than uh, to train these uh, uh, these students that are being self-taught by AI at home, you know, and it really would have been better for the FAA to go back to hiring uh, airline pilots at 500 hours because then all the bad instructors would be moved into the airline cockpit, which, by the way, people say, oh, my God, that's a terrible idea. No, it's not a terrible idea uh, because a lot of people who are bad flight instructors ended up in the airline cockpit and now they have adult supervision. And there's nothing <laughs> like a senior captain uh, pointing his finger at you saying, don't ever do that again. Don't touch that. Don't look at that. Don't touch my controls. And uh, yeah. believe me, that's how young people get trained. And it's, uh, it's there's nothing that's going to replace that. That makes uh, that makes a lot of sense. So well, I, I want to make sure I mention your books uh, as, as we come towards the top of the hour. First of all, the Rod Machado's Private Pilot Handbook, Rod Machado's oh, Instrument Pilot Handbook, Rod Machado's yeah. Instrument Pilot Survival Manual, How yeah. to Fly an Airplane, and Plane Talk. And all of this is in addition to all of the online work that you do and everything that's available at rodmachado.com. Tell me a little bit about kind of some recommendations for, for people approaching this, whether let's say the picks for the folks that are just getting started and those of us who have a, a little bit of gray hair and time in the cockpit. Listen, uh, the private pilot handbook or the private commercial handbook, it's actually, I updated it, so it's 704 pages. And uh, the instrument handbook, instrument pilots, all, they're all updated, uh, 2024 compliant, 2024 ACS compliant. I update these things as soon as anything changes and in the next reprinting cycle, that goes right into the book. Ebooks are always updated. And um, so any one of those books is great for a refresher. My How to Fly an Airplane Handbook, which is the one right up, oh, right there. How to Fly an Airplane Handbook is, is one of, uh, one that I'm most proud of because uh, there, in that book, I talk about all the flying techniques I learned at Amelia Reed Aviation, basic stick and rudder, World War II flying skills. People don't teach those things anymore. And uh, those are the things that keep you alive. Kept a lot of pilots alive in World War II. Now, I don't mean shooting down other students in the traffic pattern and things like that, but I'm talking about great stick and rudder skills, uh, stalls, recovery, anticipation, plotting, planning, scheming when you fly an airplane. Uh, it's, it's all in there. I'm, I'm very proud of that book. That's that's fantastic. So to everyone out there, of course, make sure you go to rodmachado.com. It's all available on there. Rod, thank you so, so much for taking time out of your evening and joining us here again on Social Flight Live. I, I really consider it a privilege and any love love it being an, an annual event oh, uh, where we good. all get to kick off the year with you, with you and your wonderful knowledge. You are so kind, Jeff, and kudos to you. It's always a pleasure uh, being on your show. You, you you ask the most amazing questions. This always tickles me. Okay, you you uh you speak my language. <laughs> well, that's very kind of you. Have a wonderful Thank evening, you. and thanks you thanks so much again. Thank you, my friend. Good luck to you, and have fun. We'll talk later. Take care. Bye bye. And to all of you, thank you for everything that you do for General Aviation, and for joining us here on Social Flight Live. We'll be back next week, Tuesday, January 16th with shuttle astronaut, Anna Fisher. Uh, she just had some wonderful wonderful stories, such so many firsts that happened under her watch with NASA, uh, and uh, it's going to be a great show. And then on Tuesday, January 23rd, we're staying in space for another week, and uh, at, uh, we are going to be joined by Michael Menzel, who is the lead engineer on the James Webb Telescope. Um, there is, boy, just do a little bit of search, uh, searching on what has come out of this amazing feat of uh, aerospace technology and uh, what it's going to do for science. You really do want to hear what Michael Menzel has to say. And as always, again, thank you so much for joining us, and I wish you all blue skies.